I'd like to start off with a question. Guys, this is a very important topic that we're talking about. I can tell you that on the road to writing this book that we're launching tonight, I was actually writing a follow-up to this book. I was on the fifth or sixth chapter, I think, and by then, God just said, you know what? Stop. Raised by a single mother in a back room in Zimbabwe, this is Ronald Moringai. His parents divorced when he was just six and life took a sore turn as his father disappeared from both their lives. Stewing in poverty, he says his mother did all she could to put at least bread on the table until he was 19 years old. He moved to South Africa in 1999 when things started to fall apart in Zimbabwe. Now author of two successful books that have become therapy to most, we talk to the man who's walked the struggle. Fathering Sons uh, came out of a book that I wrote uh, with the passion to kind of try and see reconciliation take place between fathers and their estranged sons. That's what pretty much this whole thing is about. My relationship with my dad was actually the main motivator in the whole of this thing because uh, after that divorce, we kind of stayed in separate places. You know, he went to stay with uh, another married wife, uh, another wife that he married, and started another family that side. So there wasn't much time really that I spent with him uh, trying to know him or getting to know him in that way. So I kind of grew up with a lot of anger, you know, to say, in as much as some other kids have their fathers and mothers at home, they're getting school fees paid, they have all their things covered, they're getting clothes, you know, new shoes and all that kind of stuff that they require. I don't get it because my dad is not around and not that he didn't have the money, he really had the money, but I don't know why, you know, we never really got to get into the detail when I had a chat with him. Anger and hurt are some of the emotions he says he went through. I, I was literally, like I said, an angry man, right? And I think in my relationship, particularly with authority, that was a bit difficult as a result of that. Because now, uh, as you'd know, if I just look at uh, psychological reports now, when a boy is growing up and when they get a uh, single, single parent home, uh, the mother being the, the, the person in charge, when they get to the age of like 12, 13, 14, it's a bit difficult for mother to discipline that child now because he's, he's almost a man. So even umamas, if, if they want to kind of give him discipline uh, using the rod or whatever it is, the boy can literally hold it and say, ah, but mom, what are you doing now? And I think at that age, if there's no man to put down the authority and say, hey, listen to your mother, or otherwise this is the law of the house, then it becomes difficult for mother to properly discipline that child. And I think I came from that uh, point as well. A brief moment of clarity and forgiveness, this is how it details their reconciliation. So with that much anger that I had and uh, that much consternation, you know, uh, I really had a urge to fix things with him. And uh, when I thought I would, I think I was already 28 years old. We went to a, a funeral uh, back in the rural areas where we come from. And on our way back, just me and him in the car, and then the car broke down in the middle of nowhere. So we waited for the mechanics to kind of come and fix it. But in the meantime, now we talked about the weather, which is what we normally talk about, talked about the sport, we talked about, you know, the school, and then we kind of ran out of issues. And at that point in time, I kind of realized, okay, you know what, if we're gonna really have a conversation, let's talk about the real issues, the stuff that I'm angry about. Why weren't you there? Why didn't you take care of us? Why didn't you pay this, etc., etc. And we had a long conversation in the dark, you know, nothing there, nobody, just, just me and him in the bundus. Uh, the, thing that came out of that is that I kind of got to forgive him and I kind of got to reconcile with him and I thought our relationship would become better from that day onwards. Unfortunately, two weeks later I was in a car accident and he passed away. So I thought, shucks, I just really got the last minute chance to reconcile with my dad before he passed away and I don't know how many other men have an opportunity like that out there, which is what I thought, this is a very important thing that we need to talk about before someone passes away. It's good to carry our anger, it's, well not really good, but you know, we, we do carry it nonetheless. But we're saying, how do we make things right before either of us passes away? A couple of years later, he finally gathered strength to pour his experience on paper. He started out by sending questionnaires to men to complete about their relationships with their fathers. Like I was saying earlier, I think most of these issues, if you try to trace them back, because nobody wakes up and decides, you know what, I'm going to beat up my girlfriend today. You know what, I'm going to slay somebody today. But if, if there's a, something that's not taken care of when we're young, when we're boys and we're molded, uh, in the right manner, then these things come out when we're older. So in other words, we don't expect uh, bo broken boys to become perfect men. In other words, we need to fix them whilst they're boys, and it starts in the house, in the family, for us to make sure that we grow and, and disciple better men into society. 
and that book has proved to be a masterpiece that is mending broken homes. It's, it's become a movement, so much so that we're actually trying to launch a foundation now that now tries to assist fathers in communities, especially within our poorer communities where most of our black people come from, to say how can we really with the limited amount that we have, because I think one of the biggest myths that people have is that a father needs to have a lot of money to take care of his children. And hence, if he doesn't have that money, he kind of runs away or doesn't take responsibility for his children. But to say, no, 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 your children just want your love. Your children just want to be taken care of by you. They want your attention. They want you to, 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 take, to take them into their confidence. And if all of that, we can understand that, then we really understand that money, of course, it enhances, but is not the core of, of a relationship between a father and his children. And with that turn to New Leaf, more people are still seeking his counsel. People come to me, yes, but what I do is refer them then to people who are qualified and trained to, be given, to give them the professional assistance that they need. What I can give is only advice. Once broken by his father's absence, we find out how Ronald's book brought together Lungisi and his father. Welcome back to the show. Ronald Muringai's book also had an impact on Lungis's life, who was without a father for 33 years. Let's have a look at his story. Sipping on love and comfort. This is Lungisi and his father. But little do people know that this hasn't always been the case. Mm. Mlungisi, much like Ronald Murungai, is a product of a single mother. And this was the first memory he heard of his father. When I was growing up, I never questioned really, like, where is uh, my, my mother? I mean, when, when I was still very small, where, where is my father? Until, uh, I think it was a year later after we had moved, um, my, my father came to, to, to see me. Then that's when I knew that, you know, I... I, it, it made sense. I, I actually have a father. Um, and then he came, and, but then the thing is, I think he was a little bit stressed in, in coming to, to see um, the mother of his children. And I think we may be considering how they separated or the, what caused them to separate. So he, he came a little bit drunk. Actually, he was really drunk. So uh, the, the image that I had of him as I grew up, because that was the only time that I saw him, was when he was, he was strong. And things only got worse from there. I remember I was in high school. I, I asked my mother, where is uh, my, 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 my father? Because I was seeing other children having their, their parents. You know? So I, curiosity started to, to rise up. Then I, I, I asked my mother, where is, where is my father? And then, oh, the way she reacted so angry. She, um, she was like, uh, do you see other children who have both parents? Do you see them being well off? You know, um, it doesn't mean when you have one, one parent, you, you will, you, when you have both parents, you're going to, to succeed. So the, it's like, it was sort of like dismissive answer. Right, how did that affect you as a child? Oh, the way it affected me was that I ended up taking that view that it's not necessary uh, there's no necessity to have a, a father in your life so i basically just shut off the, the entire idea of um having one having a father in their lives so, so so it made me to sort of like close off in terms of a uh, relationship towards um older men if I, can, if I can put it like that so i did not want to so it made me not to want to submit basically to 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 rules or to to cultural things. A man broken by his father's absence, but he still wanted a family of his own. But even with that, he still felt chained by his own issues. After I got married, the the, the confusion didn't go away, because uh, marriage doesn't actually fix the, the, the doesn't actually fix you. When you get married, you actually exposes certain things inside of you, you know. So, so um, the, the confusion and the, the rebellion did not go away. 
it had an impact in my life, in my personal life, where in my decision making, you know, where I I I I, I had to make financial certain financial uh, decisions, um, like big decisions, and because there was no grounding, no mentor in 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 my life, you know, so I I had to go through that and make those decisions, and actually ended up uh, causing a little bit of, uh, not let me not say a little bit of pain, like pain in 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 my wife. And mm. when did that change? So, so that actually changed after I, I had met him, after I had met my father. Then I remember one um, afternoon, it was in 2017, I, I, I was praying and then um, the Lord reminded me of our neighbor when we were still staying in Malamjeli. I decided to call uh, her son because her son was actually attending the same church with us in Pretoria where Ronald was attending. So I called, his, I called her son and I asked for her, for her, her numbers. She, he gave me the, her numbers, I called her, and she, 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 just, she just responded and said she's also not sure whether he's alive or dead, but if the pastor has said so, she will look for, for, for him. She, wow. will, she, will, she will try to, to look for him. Then a week later she gave me, uh, she called me back and she said she found uh, his numbers. We cannot allow circumstances of the past det determining our f how our future unfolds. As painful as it may be, the truth is and that... And this is how the book helped in that reconciliation. The God demands of us. The first time when I met my father, the, the ground rules that I, I, I actually said, because I'm the one who, who, who went to him, uh, the ground rules that I said was that we will leave everything that has happened in the past as it is. Um, because it has happened, um, we, we, we won't fix it. But then after I, I had actually um, did the questionnaires, uh, because the book had not yet come out, after I did the questionnaires, now it was November when I did the questionnaire. In, in December, now I had many questions <laughs> that I had to now revenge back on my statement that I said to him. So I, I sat with him uh, in, in December, and then that's when I started to uh, ask him the questions on what happened, how did things um, end up the way they were. Seeing that um, the way is, is a very nice person, it's a, it's a very humble person, and then the only question that came from him next was, how come then things didn't actually work out back there? You know, and then, then that's when he started to explain. But then that actually came about because I answered the, the, the question yes, that uh, Ronald uh, brought out. I in Katasa in Kizwe. Moba Pela Junkuba and Yinchen and Jesus in Kalan Neto. Moba Nalun Koskas, no moon, and look at the Nayas at Lugan. Nancy Gibos Nay. Manjo Masenia, Tinia Pindela Kumamaga Kamlunis. I want to go to the house. 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 Slutchens <laughs> I said, With the past left where it belongs, this is now their current relationship. I'm getting things from him which I never, I, I, I never thought I would get. Like, you know, things like I love you, you know, things like um, where you, 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 you will just call and um, we we'll say good night, you know, just in the sound of, of his voice, the way he say it, he say it, you know, after we finished speaking like for a very long time on the, on the, on the phone. Uh, so 
and he's a, he's a person with a very good sense of humor. So we, we, we really now, from that basis, we ended up ended up we ended up building a very nice um, relationship. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Ronald Muringai's book is not only aimed at those with absent fathers, but also those that were raised by one, but are struggling with father and son relationship. Let's see. Walking with Ronald Muringai is his friend, Ulani Mutembi. Met at church, he also manages Fathering Sons media content. Gulani was raised by his married parents, but somehow these two share a similar relationship with their fathers. The first time I ever had Ronald speak about his father was after he wrote the book. And, and, and for me, when, when he, he showed me, when I saw it from the book as, as I was designing, I then realized that this probably was a deep thing in his heart because it corresponded more to how my journey was with my father. Yeah. How was your journey? Yo. <laughs> uh, um, my, my, for me, growing up, I was not considered an academic, so I was a hard worker. Um, I remember when I finished my matric, um, my dad, I passed, but my dad was not, was not impressed. He then said to me, you won't make it, so go back and, and, and repeat matric. My mom was not pleased with that. She went behind his back, found me, registered me at Tunis. I didn't even ask me what I wanted to study. She did. So yeah, my dad wasn't pleased with the fact that I chose to go to varsity. He then said to me, because you chose not to listen to me, you will never become anything in life. Yeah, so those words really cut me deep. I think I, I struggled for varsity for five years until I dropped out. And only later on, when, when I became a father myself, I remember when I became a father, my, mom, my wife told me that we are pregnant and our son was born, I called my dad and I said to him, you know what, I don't think I'll, I'll become a great son, I have a great father to this boy until I learn to be a great son to you. So please forgive me for having disobeyed you when you wanted me to go and repeat my trick because those words that you said really cut me deep. I'm struggling today because I can't go further beyond what you said to me. And I always use biblical principles to try Healing to... pages. This is so how he says the book story. helped. The Bible talks about Rebecca. I remember when he, he sent me the, the survey as well to complete. I intentionally refused. I didn't complete the survey. And the reason was because I didn't know how my dad was going to react if he happened to read the book. So I was afraid of that. And but after I spoke to my dad, I then realized that actually it was more helpful for him than it was for me because I was continuing with my life, but here is a father who can't continue with that because he's, he's feeling bad of what he did. So, but the book itself somehow, because in terms of when we were designing and everything and I had to read the content and stuff like that, brought us more closer because we, in terms of our friendship, we then realized that we both have a, a more like a similar background. Every time when I go out doing talks, like motivational talks or preaching anywhere, I always talk about the book. I always recommend people about the book because the, the message about fathering, uh, fathers and sons or fathers and daughters is very crucial for our generation. It, it actually impacts even how we do everything else. You can never go beyond your pain. And until you re face your pain, then that is the only time you are able then to, to conquer what, the future. Because I, I'll give a simple example. Many a times we, I, we, we give ourselves these excuses. And this is what I used to say. I, would, I remember when I started my business, after I dropped out of school, I, I would say, I'm going to do this because I want to prove a point to my dad. And anger does not build anything, but it destroys everything. So as much as I had the right intention, but the motive was wrong. So I had to change all that so that I can bring profit, not only financially, but to myself, in terms of how I look at myself at the end of the day. When he met his father, we hadn't married yet. Uh, but from what he told me, he was a very angry person initially. And after that uh, sort of reconciliation, he was able to forgive his father. And I think he became a better person. He became a brilliant father to our daughter. And 
um, I couldn't have uh, asked for a better husband in that way. And I think that very event, that um, that meeting with his father, that being able to talk issues through with his father has made him that better man. Otherwise, he would have been angry, he would have not been able to relate with his daughter the way that he does right now. And she's rather impressed with the man he is. It's his drive and his passion to to have fathers reconcile with his uh, with their with their with their sons and the other way around, and I think it makes me see him in a different light altogether. He's not he's not just here to, just to be a number. He's here for a purpose, and for some weird reason, he's able to balance his business with his fatherhood uh, and the advent the ventures that he has to do with reconciling uh, fathers to sons with being a husband and being a father in our house. So we don't miss him being a father and me being being my husband uh, and being a husband to me. Um, so he's able to to strike a balance between those two, which I really appreciate for the, um, that with him, about him. Rather. But the issue of brokenness uh, between the, the relationship between fathers and sons is not just a South African ph phenomenon. It's a worldwide issue. You look at USA, you look at all the African countries, you can see that it's a problem. And I, I would love to see him touch as many people as he possibly can while he's still alive. And this is his bigger goal for the movement. So the bigger level, I would really hope <laughs> that society is different. If we look at the stats, I think it's chapter one or chapter two, it talks to how fatherhood is lacking in South Africa at the moment. And it says from a report that came out last year, actually 2018, that six out of 10 children in this country right now grow up without a father in the house. Six out of 10, that is catastrophic, that is bad. And the sad thing that, okay, that's what it is today. But if you look back 10 years, you look back 20 years, we see that the number is almost constant. Nothing has really changed over the years. But we can say back in the 80s, perhaps uh, our fathers had to go work in the mines in Houteng or they had to, so they were never really there at home to work. With. So what then justifies the same numbers showing up today? So in other words, what I'm saying is what the last generation saw is what the current generation is seeing. My hope is that what the next generation sees is different. Can we have this number reduced? Can we have more children having access to their fathers slash uncles slash malumes slash uh, grandfathers who will fill in if that is not there for whatever reason? But to make sure that we bring up wholesome children and we'll say when we do this stats again, let's do a census again and see how many children have no fathers at the house will have lesser numbers. For me, I would be a very happy man. That's what I would really love to see happen out of this thing. And I'll just like us to do a small pledge. I just customized it slightly so it can fit what we're talking about today. But I'd like you to publicly declare if that's fine with you. Is that okay? Great stuff. Men, let's dance. Let's do this thing. Whilst we're here, let someone do it. Ladies, wives, you know, listen to your husbands as they talk, as they, as they speak, as they could make this declaration that you will hold them accountable too. Yeah? Right hand on your chest. <laughs> And if you'd like to continue with this topic, you can find us on social media just simply using the hashtag Stories Untold as ABC. And if you've missed any of our show, go on to YouTube searching for us as Stories Untold as ABC. From myself, Pule Mulebazi, and the rest of the Stories Untold team, it's a goodbye.